Andrew's perspective. Hours of conversation with the prototyping department regarding Earth technology sped by like mere minutes as I prattled on without foreseeable end, enjoying once again the uninterrupted attention of my feathered hosts. All good things, however, must come to an end, and as such, it came as little surprise when Chirac and his men eventually surrounded me once more. Move! One of the soldiers cawed, lightly shoving me in the direction of our transport. Much as I understood their haste, my treatment by these men was beginning to grate upon me. In fact, were it not for the comforting presence of Vavi hopping into the seat beside me, I very well may not have kept my temper. Lieutenant. Assuming his same seat from before, Chot regarded the soldiers with an unimpressed glare before clearing his throat to speak. I would appreciate if your men would regard Andrew with more respect. His knowledge is worth more to the war effort than you could ever be, and we need to ensure he continues to comply with us. I don't see what choice it has. Chirac shrugged matter-of-factly. I'm just trying to preserve valuable equipment, Chot. I thought you'd appreciate it. Now that's just low. Another voice called out. Turning around to face the door through which I had been encouraged to enter, I was surprised to discover Teague the Red Scale stepping inside. Small size and informal mannerisms aside, the way he carried himself distinctly spoke of someone not to be trifled with. Unexpected as the diminutive Koffel's defense of me had been, I was nevertheless grateful for this aid. With his dissenting voice joined together with those of Vavi and Chot, the belligerent lieutenant was quickly silenced beneath their complaints. In truth, what really bothered me about this conversation was not that he was rude, but rather that he was right. Though for now I was a remarkably well-treated prisoner, the fact yet remained that I was a prisoner. Any and all rights I held could be revoked at any time by someone with sufficient clearance. Part of me was curious what my fate here may have been were I discovered in a more peaceful time. Perhaps my existence would be a less classified matter then. Regardless, such speculation was ultimately pointless. The universe dealt me this hand, and I was going to play it well or die trying. Our drive to the Prime Minister's location was for the most part a graciously uneventful affair. After a while, following complaints from both Vavi and myself, it was agreed that our chauffeur would pick up something greasy for us to eat. Back at the base, everything I was fed seemed like it was prepared for royalty, and as such, I was rather curious regarding what the average Kaffel citizen actually ate. Waiting in the parking lot for our driver to return, I decided at an optimal time to indulge yet another of my beloved habits, specifically that of asking questions, rather than answering them. My love for learning things was arguably surpassed only by my sheer hatred for not understanding. My relationships with teachers were very hit or miss as a result. Whereas some admired my dedication and forgave the frustrations of my incessance, others found me to be rather bothersome. Fortunately, it seemed that the Kafal held largely the same favored topic as any human, themselves. So, I asked, rhythmically tapping my fingertips upon the vehicle's central coffee table as I contemplated which curiosity I first wished to sate. Earlier at the labs, I heard someone referencing science fiction. Are alien life forms a popular staple there? Oh, absolutely. Vavi chirped, quickly launching into a tirade about some of her favorite books and movies. Apparently, she had quite the soft spot for a niche franchise similar in theme to Star Trek. It was rather sweet to hear her speaking so passionately about something more casual than scientific. No sooner had my dear friend finally stopped to catch her breath than did Chirac once again pipe up. I prefer the Void Star series. He grinned, following up Vavi's explanation with one of his own. Apparently the movies he enjoyed were about an alien invasion from beings evolved on a planet orbiting a black hole. In order to successfully fight against the Kaffel, their land invasions undertaken to abduct civilians could only be conducted at night. I will admit, it was a rather cool concept, especially their end goal of turning the Archesian Sun, the name of which, roughly translating to embrace, into a black hole which would then make Archisa habitable for them. Oh, I love those movies. Tag chirped, recounting with rapture some of his favorite moments and films of the series. Surprisingly, 
Kirok made no effort to silence the Red Scale's ramblings. In fact, he actually seemed pleased to have encountered someone sharing his interests. Really? Bavi squawked angrily, arching her body toward them with a glare. I couldn't help but find somewhat cute. Is that why you're being such a cloaca to Andrew, Lieutenant? Are you seriously about to tell me that those ridiculous fictional movies are what you've based your perceptions of real aliens off of? Hearing this, shame fell upon the Red Scale's expression as he contemplated her unfortunately aimed criticism. I, I mean, I don't think of it like... I never really... They're just good movies, you know? He chuckled despite himself, his expression clearly quite uncomfortable. Andrew obviously isn't anything like the Wekia. First off, he actually has eyes. Do you see any eggshell stuck to my plumage, Vavi? The lieutenant growled, regarding my friend with a cold and unimpressed stare. I enjoy those movies because unlike your hokey space fantasies, they provide a more realistic look at how first contact with an advanced species would go. If you own something you can't defend, then you don't really own it, do you? You're just keeping it warm for the one who does. Even with our very planet, such is true. Much as the implied accusation stung, I still couldn't fault the lieutenant's logic. Civilizations expand through colonizing, and colonizers seldom negotiate. Even worse, part of me wondered if that was what would happen if humanity had discovered them before my own arrival. Would the gears of big business hesitate for even a moment in their endless grind? Frankly, I doubted it. My hope, however, was that our governments would allow no such exploitation of these aliens. That being said, I had no intention of leaving the Kafal entirely at their mercy. You don't need to lash out on my behalf, Vavi. I sighed, gently placing a hand upon her shoulder and slowly leaning the Kafal back against her seat. I'm actually rather glad Kirak doubts me. Someone has to. What about back on Earth? Tag questioned momentarily leaving me confused as to his query before finally continuing to clarify. Do you humans have media about aliens? Of course we do. I answered matter-of-factly. We humans have depicted aliens as everything from invaders to allies. Actually, one of our greatest physicists was firmly in Chirac's camp with regards to their true nature. Oddly enough, the only times Chot spoke throughout our entire parking lot interaction were translating my own speech into Zintrish so Chirak and his men could understand. Other than that, his expression spoke of someone deeply lost in thought. About halfway through my rambling explanation regarding a favored space opera video game of mine, the conversation was abruptly cut to a halt as our driver knocked on his own door in code, prompting the startled soldiers to lower their weapons as he clambered inside with a massive bag of labeled boxes. Nobody really told me their fucking order, so I just grabbed two of everything. He explained, randomly tossing out the boxes to us. The scent of Zintral's fast food was certainly odd, but by no means would I call it unpleasant. Chitin chips. Snatching up one particular box into his claws, Teague carefully flipped open the lid before letting out a triumphant cackle, as inside it, he found what looked to be several fried arthropod analogs. Try them, Andrew. The red scale continued, thrusting the box into my hands. Unpleasant as the chitin chips appeared, I will readily admit that they were actually quite good. They almost tasted like a hybrid of shrimp and fries, and I was grateful that there were two boxes of them, given that before I knew it, I'd finished the first all on my own. What are these? Refraining the second helping of those chips, I quickly reached into another box to discover there what almost looked like miniature burger patties. These, however, were dark red and tasted like egg, save for their extra hint of iron. Ooh, blood nuggets? She cooed, extending out her claw, and upon my nod of approval, snatching one up to place into her gullet. They're made from the blood of our domestic cattle, the Agors. They're massive Borthanons that evolved away most of their pain response to avoid the nerve hijacking venom of their natural predators. We domesticated them because they're easy to keep and their blood is highly nutritious, along with their meat. Mildly disturbing cattle practices aside, the blood nuggets weren't so bad. Albeit, my vampire impression elicited minimal reaction from the group, save for deep confusion and some amount of concern from Vavi, who asked me if I was having their equivalent of a stroke. 
With that in hindsight obvious knowledge in mind, I vowed to at some point explain human legends to them. Cryptozoology was largely nonsense. Sure, save for exceptionally rare cases, like the formerly cryptid gorilla, but I'd be a liar to say it wasn't entertaining nonsense. My favorite thing on the entire menu, however, was the drink. It tasted sort of like a carbonated smoothie, but the fizzing reaction was apparently entirely natural from the biochemical reactions of a certain fruit. Unfortunately, Zintral's lack of a food and medicinal regulatory body meant that none of my fellow passengers knew the real caloric composition of such a beverage. Regardless, the meal was an overall enjoyable experience. It did, however, bring to my mind the question of which earth foods I would find myself missing most in 10 years. Novel experiences aside, there was some small part of me that wished I could return there someday. Looking back to my younger days, I often derided my home planet as a godforsaken space rock. But damn it, it was our godforsaken space rock, and more than anything I hoped my kind were taking good care of it, or at least better care of it. Pushing those thoughts aside for the moment, my attention suddenly fell heavily upon the task before me. Like it or not, I was about to be the first human to meet with an alien head of state, and such a fact was no less terrifying than it was amazing. Following a few hours of quiet contemplation, eventually, I could no longer keep such an anxiety to myself. Chot, I called, waking my translator from his mid-journey slumber with the lightest possible flick to the shoulder I could muster. On what? The ambassador yawned, leaning forward as though to better maintain consciousness amidst the darkened vehicle. Judging by the clock on our driver's dashboard, it was the middle of the night. Salkim, I continued, immediately shocking the Kafel into alertness as he scrutinized my expression with newfound seriousness. What about him? Smoothing back my moistening hair, I paused for a moment to contemplate my question's phrasing, checking it for any potential false implications, before finally spitting out the simple question. What am I supposed to do and say when I meet him? The sudden sensation of Vavi's unconscious head bobbing down onto my shoulder startled me slightly, as amidst the newfound tension, Chot replied. I'd rather not lead you astray. He began, fiddling anxiously with his arm feathers, as though contemplating his own next words. Andrew, I know you'll know what to say, and I trust that when the time is right, your actions will reflect you as what we all know you are, our last hope, but a hope nonetheless. Thank you for watching. Like, share, and subscribe for more original content. New chapters and standalone stories uploaded weekly.